Wow, I should have done that. Well, that was lovely. I should have done that uh, after, uh, before we <laughs> start recording. Hello! Before and welcome to recording. this. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 75 of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, a D&D and Magic the Gathering podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. Ooh, man. The delay on that motherfucker, man. Ooh, boy. Ooh, boy. I might have to edit. I might have to cut around that. If not, all of that, all of this is in, and it's hilarious regardless. But we got a lot of nonsense to talk about this week. A lot of dumb bullshit that we have to deal with in our community, as per the usual. Um, CEDH, a format in Magic the Gathering, competitive commander. They attempted to create a fan cre- since the last episode of the podcast, mind you. This has all happened in the last like two weeks. Of they, there was a community effort to create a rules committee, and then a lot of the community didn't like it, and now we don't have a rules committee anymore. Yeah. So that's fun. <laughs> um, we, we've got a little bit of background information from some CEDH players that we know uh, that'll help. We're also going to go over all the Duskborn House of Horror previews. Not super in-depth. We're going to save that for an episode of bonus action with our good friend Typical Gemini, which would be very fun. Uh, but yeah, in the... In the meantime, Sam, how how you been? It's been like two weeks since we last spoke. It has been two weeks. Uh, yeah, I mean, getting settled in here at the new homestead at this half of the Dungeon Bros headquarters. Uh, getting rearranged, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, no, it's been okay. It's been okay. Yeah, so like, the ha- the house is coming together. I have a room with a pc in it so that's very convenient for this whole process i don't have to stand i don't have to stand illuminated by the glow of the sun behind me anymore and like holding (laughs) my microphone i actually have an arm look at that it's like nifty shit it's very convenient um i do have some good news for you as well as i got a phone call this morning from our previous property manager at our previous property for those of you that don't know we spent what four years living together uh Two and a half of which yep, we were making like dumb TikToks and, and podcasts and stuff. Um, got a phone call this morning. Didn't have a fordering adjust for either of us. So I gave them mine. And at some point, I'll be getting a check for our security deposit of whatever is left of that. It could be Ooh. literal hundreds of dollars. It could be literal tens of dollars. They didn't tell me how much. So, you know, Duskmorn pre-release kits might be paid for. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. That w- it would be very nice. Um, very nice. Very nice. But that remains to be seen. Uh, but yeah. Okay, we've done that. We've talked about this. Uh, what are we? What are we playing? I don't. I'm not really playing anything right now. I'm moving. I'm watching Rings of Power season two, which is really really good. Uh, better than the first season. Oh yeah, season and two. People. People are still talking shit about Rings of Power, and I hold firm. I hold firm. I have said this since the first season came out. There's going to be a massive revisionist history about this show, about how good it is. When I will remember at the time, I'll remember the names. I'll remember the faces. of All these motherfuckers have been talking shit about this show. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. Because there's a lot. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, I'm not really playing much of anything (laughs) at the moment. (laughs) I mean, I have picked up, uh, I as in uh, the group of people that I play some some TTRPGs with, we've started playing a Blades in the Dark game, which is a, uh, a mm-hmm. TTRPG set in like, uh, uh, what's the word, like steampunk-esque horror world. Uh, and the whole thing is centered around, you got, your, your team is being a set of criminals, and... Uh, it's all about heists. Is there's there, we have an entire s- adventure supplement book about heists. I don't know if that's a th- I mean I don't know if that's a thing you would want to look into or not, but you know, it's a whole. So it's it's a very different system. Um, it's based on the uh, what is it apocalypse world system. It's kind of derivation of that. But what's interesting mm-hmm. about it is you don't plan the heist. You start in the middle of the heist, and there's a whole mechanic where you have where you get to flash back, in order to say this is how I plan to take care of this issue that we have just run across. 
flashbacks is like such a crazy concept for <laughs> for a high style game. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it's it really just is. like it, the movies. It, it makes it's it exactly more like the 11, movies where Ocean it's like they're do- mm-hmm. Yeah, like like we're already into the heist, and now we're showing you how we got to this point, and like what the hell is actually happening. Um, I did forget. Yes. I did forget one thing. Um, I'm not playing Magic right now, but I did make a Magic purchase at the Costco recently because they're doing that thing again where they have the Commander bundles. Um, and there is a pre-con mm-hmm. that I've been considering getting for a while from March of the Machines. Uh, it's the Orzhov one uh, with Brimaz, Blight of Arescos, uh, which is like the Orzhov Phyrexian artifact creature stuff. Um, so I got that bundle at Costco. Mm-hmm. It came with the commander deck, which I have here. I've added, I think, 15 cards pretty much all of them are from march of the machine or aftermath and like that kind of stuff because i wanted to make it more phyrexian typal than Mm -hmm. um like the artifact incubator thing that they had going on and it came with two like promo planeswalkers jace memory adept and then a johnny um mentor of something something that a johnny card for one when i tried scanning them both in the promo versions of them that are being released those those versions didn't exist in my dragon shield tracker app so (laughs) don't know what's up with that but the like regular a johnny is like 15 bucks i don't think the promo is going to be worth that much but it's really cool and it came with a march of the machines pack a bloomborough pack and a Commander Masters pack. So, in terms of just like off the shelf value for forty bucks plus tax, I think it was like forty three something at the register. Uh, you're getting a Commander deck that you can get for about like thirty thirty five bucks, and then well more than ten dollars worth of packs and promos. So. If you're in the market for one of those pre-cons, you got a Costco membership, check it out. It's a whole thing. If you're an addict, stay away. <laughs> I mean, Costco is great. Obviously, you know, getting some bulk uh, chicken nugs is great. But when you can go in there and grab commander packs as well, well, what's mm-hmm. wrong with that? It's two birds, one chicken nugget. You know, it's it's basically the same thing. So when uh, in the coming <laughs> week or two, I'm pro- <laughs> in the coming week or two, I'm going to uh, be inviting everyone over for a commander night, and we're gonna we're gonna bust out the Phyrexian typo with Brimaz. So that'll be fun. Anyway, anyway, let's get into the upcoming. Oh wait. No. I'm skipping right over the rundown. You can get this, the Duels and Manadors podcast, every other week. Uh, We used to record it live. We no longer record it live because we're remote and we're figuring things out. But you can get it on podcast services around the globe. Apple, Google doesn't exist anymore. So it's just Apple, Spotify, YouTube music. You can leave us a review. That's a great way to help us out. (laughs) Uh, You can follow us on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Discord. Uh, Monday Night Magic is on hiatus right now, but we'll probably be bringing that sometime in the coming weeks. Ideally before October, we'll see. Haven't really gotten into that because I'm still, you know, unpacking. Because I got a lot of shit and I work two jobs. <laughs> and here we are. Um, That's a lot oh, to unpack. the YouTube channel. It is. It, it is. You can also follow us on Patreon. You can join the Patreon for free. You can get... Um, you get access to ask us questions for the show. Uh, you can also join us at the $5 tier for early ad free access, $15 to get your name read at the end of the show, uh, which we will do later, but we will get into the upcoming releases as we do each and every week. Sam, what is coming out in the world of D and D and magic? I think we probably know. Yeah, we probably know. We've gone over these a lot, but Hey, finally one week from today of recording, or if you're listening, uh, Tomorrow when it's released, six days, the player's handbook for 1D&D will be coming out, or the 2024 revision of 5th edition is finally at full release, so that's exciting. Uh, We've had a chance to look over a little bit. Plenty of people are putting out videos, so if you want to know what you're getting, go check those out. Uh, Up next will be in November 12th of this year. That'll be the 
uh, Dungeon Master's Guide release, and finally rounding out one day in, uh, the initial core book release of the 2024 revision of 5th edition, which is a ridiculous name we still think. Uh, that'll be February 18th of next year will be the Monster Manuel. They couldn't come up with any better name for any of these. Like, the 5.5e would have been totally fine. <laughs> People would have been totally okay with that. One D&D, they would have been, been okay with that. It's just, I don't know. I don't like it. <sighs> Wizards. 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 Anyway, moving on to anyway. Magic the Gathering. We have Duskmorn, House of Horror. Debut season started about two weeks ago at PAX West, and now we are uh, going through pre-release coming up on September 20th with the full release on September 27th. We're going to talk about that just a little bit today. Yeah. And going on next, we have the Mystery Boosters 2 release. That'll be at Magicon Vegas on October 25th through the 27th. Uh, good luck getting those. And finally, this year, we'll have the release of Magic the Gathering Foundations. Uh, that will be released on November 15th. And I'm pretty sure we know about, but we haven't gotten, like, an official announcement for the race car set. Like, the, the car racing thing that they're doing with Magic. I yeah. don't know. We also know there's a, the the Marvel crossover, the Final Fantasy crossover for Universes Beyond. We don't have any details on those yet, so it's a whole thing. Yep, but, I'm sure we'll get some more some some more information as the new year yeah. comes around because that's surprisingly not that far away. Oh God, I don't I don't need to be reminded of that like at all. Ooh, we're getting into dusk morning, and I hear this the squeaky door. The squeaky door in the background. I can only assume yes. a, a Jason a Jason Voorhees style uh, machete murderer has come to relieve you of your head. Yes, that machete murderer is known as Bindi the dog. Oh, Bindi. We love Bindi. We love Bindi. Anyway, let's get now into the news <laughs> as we do. And... <sighs> We're, we're in for a fucking doozy for this one today. So the CEDH community has been in turmoil for the last two weeks as uh, several prominent members of the CEDH community uh, opened up the CEDH Rules Committee, uh, a fan-made committee where they were going to be enforcing specific bans and possible rule changes to the EDH format that are specific to competitive EDH. Uh, it was headed up by Evan Pierce, known as Freedom Waffle, who was a longtime Magic Enjoyer, been playing on and off since 2008. He specializes in CEDH and has competed in various tournaments across the country since 2022. Um, there were several others that were on the team as well, but <laughs> since the announcement of this rules committee, uh, the entire team has since been disbanded. And that was due to a large outpouring of distrust, I guess should say. So people were originally fearful of what they wanted to do as a rules committee. The main thing that they were suggesting and what they had is that there was like a leaked ban list, apparently, that was never confirmed. The only thing that they ever really confirmed was wanting to ban Ristic Study. Um, we have some CEDH players uh, that we are friends and acquaintances with, and I've gotten some background information from them off the record, uh, so we're not going to be quoting them here. But uh, with Ristic Study, the in CEDH tournaments specifically, it just creates really boring play patterns of just like drawing so many cards. Like people are trying to cast four, five, six spells in a turn. If you're trying, and especially with how the meta is speeding up, like turn two, turn three wins are much more prevalent now than they used to be. It used uh, in the last year, like pre some pre Nadu summer, basically it's been like four, five, six turn wins. Uh, and now it's definitely mm -hmm. speeding up quite a bit. So getting rid of things like Ristic Study, uh, ultimately, I think is more than reasonable uh, for CDH specifically. But the problem that most people had was initially, initially it was the concept of bannings for cards to begin with. They weren't people weren't entirely sure if CDH needed that. Then it became 
oh, this panel is all white guys. And I think you can see where this is going to go. It then became, oh, this one person on the panel follows a bunch of conservative people. And now that person is a Nazi. I feel like, I feel like we moved past this kind of shit in like 2016. But I guess 2016 history is repeating itself yet again here. We're never going to get past this. I mean, every 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 corner we turn, um, there's you know, and it doesn't matter you know on which side of the of the spectrum you want to fall with your political beliefs. But we've seen uh, and and we'll <laughs> we'll talk about uh, so we'll talk about a little bit D and D stuff in in a hot second. That's a little too liberal for people, and now this yeah. guy's a little too conservative. It's you can it's. So how I have structured my own personal political beliefs in my life, especially in a post-college world, is I have found that if what I say and what I believe pisses off the unhinged lunatic fringe on this side, and then also somehow pisses off the unhinged lunatic fringe on this side, then I'm probably doing something relatively okay. You know what I mean? And... (laughs) <laughs> from from an objective point of view, yeah, from an objective point of view with the CEDH Rules Committee specifically, do you want diversity on these kinds of panels? Yes. I think diversity of thought and opinion and diversity of Magic the Gathering play styles is much more important than diversity of skin color, nationality, gender. Does that mean that CEDH is only for straight white men? Obviously not. Of course it is not. There are people across the spectrum of race and sexuality and gender that can play and enjoy and succeed in CEDH. When you go to a CEDH tournament, when you go to a magic tournament in general and you look around that hall, what is 95% of the people that you see there? Dudes that look like us. Dudes that look like Sam and I. (laughs) Like... It's not it's not to say that other people aren't welcome. Of course they are welcome. And some of the best CDH players in the world are women, are are people of color, are gay people, are like across all of the spectrums. And in an attempt to rectify this, uh, the CEDH Rules Committee was looking to bring on other people to try and increase the diversity, specifically uh, Luastradust, who is a female cosplayer and content creator around uh, Magic the Gathering and D&D, uh, as well as Ken Likes Carbs, uh, who is a... Um, Basically, he was just replacing one of the people. Uh, he's a writer and a CEDH player for, uh, what is this, books in, I don't know, books in sex. It's a whole thing. And they were trying to curtail to some of these demands. And then ultimately, um, as of two days ago from the recording of this, they they committed to disband the CEDH Rules Committee to begin with. Uh, they have a whole thread here on Twitter. Uh, sorry, X, formerly known as Twitter. So stupid. But it the, the reaction to ending the CEDH Rules Committee is, of course, the, um, the mix of, ha-ha, about time we expected that, you all suck, to... Well, I commend your attempt, and I hope that we get something good in the future. And I appreciate your attempt to that was made to bring represent, representation and change to the format. Uh, it was nice to get a little excited at the idea of a format shakeup and formal rules guidance. Now, we're not here to police opinions and political views. I think people need to just generally calm down when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, but... What I find more interesting is this was a genuine attempt for the community to self-regulate a format that is a casual format, that is a fan-run format, effectively, uh, to self-regulate themselves as opposed to having an official committee come in and step in and kind of organize them themselves. Do you think that formats should be more fan and more player led in terms of bannings and general like rules changes. It's uh it's an interesting topic to talk about because, and, and we mention it all the time uh, when it comes to 
how very competitive formats usually do their rulings and bannings is based on uh, on the metas versus the very casual format of of commander um you know it has the rules committee that does bans very you know uh, very with a very calm level head trying to make sure that the format you know can can continue to be blossoming in whatever direction um as far as CEDH which is obviously not a um you know like you said it's it's still fan fan run and casual run it's very interesting to try and figure out what that community in particular wants because it is different than the major mm-hmm. overall community of EDH it's a smaller subsection and they want to they they want to play in a specific way mm-hmm. um that being said i'm it it really will come it will really come down to the people and their understanding of one the community and two the the gameplay the game styles that those ha- that they have um cuz if you if you think about the re- the casual player you know uh everybody will freak out about a card then you watch somebody who does a CDH podcast in particular and they'll be like yeah this card is okay this card is okay well, everybody yeah. else in the community is is like end of the world you, you, burn down magic i mean you look at something like voya jaws of the conclave specifically and that's a commander that is like a boogeyman in casual formats but is basically unplayable at high level tables and i feel like there are a lot of magic cards that end up finding themselves in that we're a little bit too strong for some casual mm-hmm. tables and we're a little bit too salty for casual tables but at the same time we're not good enough to be played at high level competitive tables and in my opinion uh, obviously, Voya, I think, is a bit of an exception because that card is clearly designed for Commander specifically. But a lot of these cards that fall into mm-hmm. that category aren't really designed for Commander in the first place, you know? True. So, anyway, I don't really have much I want to say on uh, the CEDH Rules Committee any further. I think a lot of the outpouring of hatred towards them because of their political beliefs or because of the color of their skin is a little bit disturbing to me, but that's just kind of par for the course in uh, Twitter discourse. So it is what it is, I guess. But I would rather talk about Duskborn previews because we got a lot of previews. We haven't quite gotten the whole set yet. Uh, but I definitely want to call out because to tie it into CEDH, to tie it into CEDH, I think I'm going to dismantle my Yuriko deck as it is right now and reassemble it at a CEDH level. And oh, really? a card that I would, re- yes, That's fair. a card that a card that I would really, really like to include and get from Duskmorn is one of the new Planeswalkers, Kaido, Bane of Nightmares. Uh, It is two blue black for a four loyalty Kaito Planeswalker. It has ninjutsu, one blue black. So ninjutsu is a keyword ability where you pay the mana cost and you return an unblocked attacker you control from the battlefield to your hand, and then you get to put that card onto the battlefield from your hand, tapped and attacking. Uh, So basically you're just, you're taking out a low, usually you're taking out something like a changeling outcast that can't be blocked it's cheap it's one mana and then you're sneaking in something bigger that's guaranteed to hit because it's after the declare a blockers step um so kaito is a planeswalker we can't really enter in tapped and attacking except during your turn as long as kaito has one or more loyalty counters on him he is also a three four ninja creature and has hexproof notably he does not have indestructible as well. So on future turns, uh, you're not necessarily going to benefit from attacking with him as much because he can be destroyed via combat damage since he doesn't have um, indestructible associated with him. But the important thing here, he's a four mana or a four loyalty planeswalker. His plus one ability, his plus one ability gives you an emblem with ninjas you control get plus one plus one. An emblem on a plus one ability, even though it's just a basic anthem, with the way that ninjutsu works, you could ninjutsu... Well, like, actually, no, this wouldn't work how I think it would work. My apologies. Because I was thinking you'd be able to ninjutsu him in, get the attack damage, and then activate his plus one loyalty ability before ninjutsuing something else in. So he goes back to your hand, and you can kind of just like repeat that a couple of times. But you can't activate loyalty abilities at instant speed, so it doesn't matter. But no. his zero ability... 
Surveil two, then draw a card for each opponent who has lost a life this turn. So generally, you're going to be doing that on your second main um, in a Yuriko deck specifically, which is why I want to get him. When you're getting your Yuriko flip, if the Yuriko trigger, you flip a card off the top of your library, if it's a card with a mana value of one or more, all of your opponents take a damage. So in a Yuriko deck, that is effectively zero loyalty, surveil to draw three in a commander format. And then as minus two taps down a creature, you put two stun counters on it. So this is a very shockingly powerful planeswalker that seems designed specifically for the Yuriko deck in general. And Yuriko has been getting a lot of new tools this year between <laughs> modern horizons three with like the, the MDFC lands uh, with Kaito, even with uh, Thunder Junction, with the new Satoro Yumiza or the new Satoro the, that draws you cards, it has Menace. Um, so yeah, that's that's my personal favorite Planeswalker. I also like, much like uh, Gideon, is a Planeswalker that's also a creature. So that's fun. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you got to talk about what card? Yeah. What card speaks to you, Sam? <laughs> <clears throat> Pardon me. Oh God, don't die! Um, don't die! So that's the ninja coming into fucking. Get it you. really is. <laughs> what uh, What's interesting about Kaido is uh, one that is the exact thing that uh, you know. I think a lot of people are going to go to. Unfortunately, it's it's going to probably stay up in price just because anybody who's ever heard of ninjas wants to make a ninja deck, and like that sounds awesome just because that plus one anthem oh, yeah. that's repeatable. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to a little legendary creature here. It's the Mind Skinner. This is blue, blue, blue for a legendary enchantment creature nightmare. Uh, it's a 10-1. It says, Mind Skinner can't be blocked. If a source you would control would deal damage to an opponent, prevent that damage, and each opponent mills that many cards. So, this, this, this creature, this 10-1, uh... Technically, can't deal damage because uh, it's you're going to it's going to prevent its own damage. But this has just sent Mill into a new era in Commander. I think. Mm -hmm. Being able to mill ten in Commander for each opponent is is a really big soup up. And I want to I want to pull out a piece of tech that I saw on this card on Twitter. There are a lot of cards that have the words damage can't be prevented. So this is yeah, a three mana 10 true. one that can't be blocked. And then the damage can't be prevented. If you're playing that usually is a, an ability that you see in red cards. So if you're in a, in is it shell or like mm -hmm. a Jeskai shell, something like that, that has access to red and blue. Um, even, uh, the there's a card from Duskmorn where you can't gain life and damage can't be prevented. It's the Lupine something something I think, and those cards will just now give you let you have a three mana ten uh, attack power creature that can't be blocked. <laughs> yeah, I mean this you thing dies to removal effect, but, really easy. You know. So um, it uh, <laughs> as, but as yeah, does if, everything. Uh, if, if you're if you're playing against this thing, if you're playing against this thing, man, uh, that lightning bolt is going to do you great, great abilities. That pyro class that's being reprinted in the set is going to be lovely. Oh yeah. Here. Uh, but oh yeah, yeah. I can see this. I can see this definitely uh, taking taking mill to a new level. What's next? Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about the rare land cycle in the set, the Verge land cycle. Uh, these lands have they can tap for two colors of mana. I'm looking at the Flood Farm Verge as an example here. That is the blue and white dual land. Uh, it does not have uh, basic land types, so it's not really fetchable off of some of your more regular, like your normal fetch lands and stuff. But it enters untapped, and it can tap for a white mana. And then it can also tap for a blue mana, but you can only do that if you control a plains or an island. Uh, which I don't know if you know this, there are a lot of dual lands that are plains and islands, as well as basic lands and other, thing that have the, other things that have those basic land types. So in a commander context, in a lot of formats, these cards are basically dual lands that are going to enter untapped, and you can tap for both colors of mana like immediately. Mm -hmm. So of course these are twenty, thirty dollar lands already. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. So if if you manage to pull any of these lands, that they, they, we've we've seen a trend recently where some of the rare lands that land cycles they've been printing have been like fine, have been okay, not crazy. I think these verge lands are going to end up being mana based staples, uh, specifically for commander decks. That's that's for sure. And you know, with the with some of these rare land cycles that. Uh, have been, like you said, becoming staples, man. The the trend of, of a little bit of like targeted land destruction that we've been seeing in red, for example, over the past couple of sets, and the uh, re-implementation in mm-hmm. uh, uh, Modern Horizons 3 of the uh, non-basic land hate, Man, even in even in casual commander, that that stuff might still start to rear its uh, rear its head a little bit, just because like how many good uncommons there are out there, or unbas- non-basics there are out there. Oh yeah, and there's there they've been printing utility lands for a while, not just wasteland that. They're not as efficient as a wasteland at getting rid of non-basics, but they've been printing these cards mm-hmm. for a very long time, and I think they kind of saw the writing on the wall. It's like, if we're going to be doing new land cycles all the time, some of these are going to be really powerful, and a lot, they're going to need to be dealt with, but we don't want to institute like mass land destruction because the community doesn't like that. Um, also, right. as a small asterisk, since I'm not going to take two slots for lands, I'm going to mention the common land cycle as well. Uh, they're, they're dual lands that enter untapped if you have 13 or less life. Um, so in Commander, not as useful, starting at 40 life, but in a format like Popper specifically, uh, it's very easy to self life loss to just take damage, and now suddenly you have a cycle of untapped duels in Popper, or even in some formats like Standard and Modern, depending on your playstyle. And the cat, what do you want? Oh, do you want me to throw a mouse? <laughs> you, I can't even reach the mouse. If you want me to throw the mouse, I need to like be able to reach the mouse. No? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> anyway, what do you got to talk about? <laughs> uh, I want to talk about the mechanic survival. Or the, the it's not, uh, it's a keyword ability. Um, not to be confused with the mm-hmm. keyword. Uh, so, example B, the Rootwise Survivor. Uh, who has a, has a line that says survival. At the beginning of your second main phase, if it is tapped, put three plus one counters on it, up to Put three plus one counters on up to one target land control. That land becomes a zero zero elemental in addition to its other type. It gains haste until end of turn. Uh, so the root wise survivor, not that interesting individually, but the entire uh, the the mechanic itself, um, I think is first off. There's plenty of cards that we already have that when you tap them, they do a thing. So to have these creatures that on their face say if you attack with me then you get an additional benefit however i think these are going to be very interesting when uh it comes to the race car set next year because you need to tap Mm -hmm. creatures in order to uh you know crew vehicles or uh saddle mounts and i'm wondering if we're going to start seeing some more of that stuff in hopes that uh and they're pushing hopes towards future sets with these current mechanics yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of really cool keyword abilities. I mean, obviously, we're bringing, we're bringing back Delirium, which is a fun mechanic of trying to fill your graveyard with multiple land types. Uh, Survival is a fun one. I also really think Manifest Dread is a very interesting one as well, kind of twist on manifesting yes. cards in general. And obviously, there's going to be several cards that I'm probably going to be adding to um, my Yaris, Roar of the Old Gods, face down deck uh just as some nice like quality of life upgrades uh but yeah yeah no i i there's a lot of fun there's a lot of fun keywords and i do like the 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 pull there on uh future sets because obviously that race car set's going to have a fuck ton of vehicles and a bunch of crewing is going to be happening and pilots and all that kind of stuff so yeah that's a that's a good pull um i want to let's talk about the ley line cycle because we originally Uh, saw the ley line of hope uh 
we saw the Leyline of Hope when they announced the set. If a crew, if you would gain life, you gain that much life plus one instead. As long as you have at least seven life more than your starting life total, creatures get plus two, plus two. Uh, this Leyline cycle, they all cost two and then two of the same color pips. So Leyline of Hope is two white, white. They're enchantments. If they are in your opening hand, you get to put them onto the battlefield for free uh, as a uh, as like a pre-game action. Uh, we now have seen all five of them. Uh, we'll do Leyline of the Void is the black one. One, and it's if a card would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, you exile it instead. It's just some graveyard hate. Uh, I think the Leyline of the Void is probably the most niche of the five that we get, followed by Leyline of Mutation, which is the green one. Uh, it has kind of a Jota the Archmage style ability. You may pay white, blue, black, red, green, rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. Uh, so despite the fact that it is a green ley line, it is effectively a five color ley line, uh, not dissimilar to ley line of the guild pact. And it's going to require a creature that's probably more than five mana to really be getting value out of it in any way. Um, I think both of those are at the bottom, followed by ley line of hope and then ley line of transformation uh, is probably my favorite one, but not necessarily. Uh, I would okay. I would actually say Leyline of Residence would probably be the second one. It's the red Leyline. Uh, when you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only a single creature you control, you copy that spell and you may choose new targets for the copy. Uh, so any anything that's copying spells, you're able to get this in for free. It's only four mana. It's an enchantment, so it sticks around. Uh, but I think. Upon further inspection, the most powerful one's the Leyline of Transformation. Uh, it's the blue one. When it enters, you choose a creature type. Creatures you control are the chosen type in addition to their other types. The same is true for creature spells you control and creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield. Uh, so kind of a, a bit of a souped up Maskwood nexus. But it's always exciting to get a ley line mm -hmm. cycle. It's always exciting to have one in your starting hand and be like, look, we haven't even started playing and I already got this on the battlefield. I'm already at an advantage. I, I think that the ley line, a lot of the ley lines obviously aren't uh, super helpful in a more casual game. Um, obviously, we don't, I don't think we see a lot in CDH either. But of these ones, I would agree that the ley Not line usually. of resonance and ley line transformation, yeah. Uh, just because four mana is a lot. Um, even, in, even in the casual realm these days, four mana can be a lot, but that getting them onto the, the field for free. I think Leyline of Resonance has the most uh, the most opportunity to be accidentally powerful. You yeah. know, if somebody cracks that in a pack and is like, "Ah, oh, cool! I have a red, a blue, and a blue red spell slinger deck." Like, I'll just throw that in there. First time they get that down, then they accidentally win on turn three or four due to some shenanigans. Well, I'm thinking there there are specific decks where this card is going to be actively very good. I mean, I think of course my. Um my oh my god oh my god Favorite feather deck. the redeemed oh. feather the redeemed uh because all she wants to do is have your spells target your creatures zada hedron mm -hmm. grinder uh kind of redundant i think for zada just because you would target zada and then you get copies for everything but stuff like that where you're trying to target your own your own creatures with things there's plenty of decks that are like that and most of them have access to red um but yeah, still a bit more niche, whereas I feel Leyline of Transformation, if you are in a deck that has blue and cares about the creature types, um, Leyline of Transformation is just kind of going to help out everything that you're trying to do there. My thing with that is, uh, yeah, you might, you might, it depends on the creature type, I think. You know, if you're going mm -hmm. with Merfolk, you already got every piece of tech you need in Merfolk, um... If you're going birds, you're going to have every piece of tech you need in birds. So yeah. that one might be for a little more, uh, you know, a couple, a, a bit more niche of that individual type of creature. But again, I don't, you know, absolutely nothing wrong with with that card appearing in a deck. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? I've only got one more card I want to call out. I've got. Uh, I think we. Uh, I've got two. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll go back and forth one more time. I've got two more. One is disorienting choice. Disorienting choice is three and a mm -hmm. green for a sorcery that says for each opponent choose up to one target artifact or enchantment that player controls. For each permanent chosen this way, its controller may exile it. 
Then, if one or more chosen permanents are still on the battlefield, you search your library for up to that many land cards, put them onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. Um, so this is very reminiscent of uh, the uh, offers, the tempting offer um, cycle of, of cards, except this one also has a little bit of removal on it. Uh, and not only, you know, with a lot of the tempting offer ones, it's like, okay, we just, we don't take the offer. That's the obvious thing to do. Because uh, if I, I get one land, you mm. get one land, you go, well, well, he gets four lands. That's not fair. <laughs> that's That's not good for any of us. However, this one, with this one, it's a little yeah. harder, right? Like, it's like, okay, well, you know, if you if you really want the land, then you're going to choose something big on their board, like uh, like a Dark Steel, um, like Dark Steel Forge, or or something like that, or the Aristic Study. Like, if you if somebody has Aristic Study and you choose it out, well, that's a hard choice for them. Do they, you know, depending on where you are in the game, do they want to give you a land, yeah. any land, or do they want to keep drawing cards? So I think that's a very yeah, interesting. I, card. I, the the ch- those choice cards tend to be very clear. You don't take the free gift because you're if if everyone agrees to not take the gift, then the person casting it is basically getting a very overcosted ability. So it's very very easy. But having that mm-hmm. extra level of of choice there, it, ca- it makes the game it makes the choice more interesting. And as the person casting it, you're much more likely to get your value out of it, too, which is very, very nice. Yeah, um, you can get what you want, either the removal or the mm-hmm. or the land itself. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, no, that one's, that one's a fun one. That one's a fun one. I hadn't thought about that one until you called it out. Very good. Uh, the last one that I want to talk about, uh, this was featured on a deck tech from the professor at the Tolarian Community College as the helm of a Build Your Own Commander deck, the Jolly Balloon Man. One red white oh, yes. for a one four human clown with haste. Uh, you pay one and you tap the clown. You create a token that's a copy of another target creature you control, except it is a 1-1 one, one red balloon creature in addition to its other colors and types. And it has flying and haste. You sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. You can activate this ability only as a sorcery. So it's fair. You can only do it on your turn. Uh, but you are also able to on your turn. copy him and untap him. And it's all, you know, it's all very, very fair. He said sarcastically. Um, oh, Bindi. Poor little puppy. Poor little <laughs> unhappy girl. Um, I, I, for one, the ability is very powerful. It's already getting a lot of... Oh my gosh, that's Salem. Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous human Salem. being. Oh my God, look at them. Oh my God. Hello. <laughs> okay, bye. Uh, <laughs> but with the Jolly Balloon Man specifically, obviously it's already drawing attention because the ability is powerful. Uh, I think it's also drawing attention because mm-hmm. the art is fucking horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's something, you know? Like. It's. I don't know who the fuck thought that that would be a good idea, but I commend them. Uh, ultimately, a three mana, one four hasty thing that makes tokens and boros is going to be very, very fun. Um, so. Check out that uh, Tulane Community College deck tech if you're into that sort of thing, because who doggy, he's weird. All right, last card, Sam, last card. Who doggy? All right, last card we're going to talk about for right now. Um, let's go with, you know what, we're talking about dis- disturbing um, imagery. Let's go with the giggling skitter spike. Oh, this is a gosh. four mana... 1-1 one, one artifact creature toy it, with indestructible. When the, the giggling skitter spike attacks, blocks, or becomes the target of a spell, it deals damage equal to its power to each opponent, and then it has the ability to pay 5 mana and uh, make it monstrous and give it 5 plus 1 counters. Um, so this is a little, uh, this is a little stuffy doll a little brash taunter, a little bit of mm-hmm. a, a little bit of a uh, you know everything I love in a deck stapled on a four mana artifact creature. I love the uh, the return of monstrosity uh, originally from my beloved first set of magic mm-hmm. Theros. Um, 
be it's for ultimately if you're if you're doing the monstrosity it's nine mana for a six six with indestructible which is a little over cost but uh a fun thing this goes bit. very well in those kinds of cheap combat tricky decks because if you're casting multiple combat tricks on the giggling skitter spike one mana plus two plus one it's like oh, okay it triggers on the targeting of the spell so it it, everyone only takes one, but then it's like a four something, and then you target it again, and it's four damage, and then it's like a six or eight, or like seven something, and then you can attack with it, and then it's another seven, and then you can, and you can just kind of repeat that. Oh, it, I I like it. Uh, it's, it functions a bit differently than like a brash taunter or a stuffy doll, uh, based on, with the targeting. I like that it can make itself bigger. Indestructible makes it like an amazing blocker as well uh, that discourages attacking you in the first place. Uh, yeah, that one was from uh, the commander decks as well, so that's very fun. Yes, it is. Yep. And alrighty, there is one more. There is one more I forgot. The TV. One more? One it's more. the TV. It's oh, the yes, one that, of course. The three mana rock, it taps for white or black because of black and white TV, and then you can pay a life to tap for any of the other colors to make it a color TV. Very thematic and very fun. Anyway. Love it. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. We've got three items. Uh, three item- Actually, hold on. Let's, let's skip ahead. Let's do this Q&A now. Uh, this is from our patron, Brandon. Uh, are you guys exci- as excited for Duskworn as I am? Uh, Brandon is very pumped, and he thinks it is his favorite set of the year so far. Um, I personally still feel like Bloomborough is my favorite like core regular set of the year. I like the, th- the themes of Bloomborough much more than I like the themes of Duskborn. I'm not a mm-hmm. super big horror person, but I can totally see that Duskborn has a lot more thought and care to its gimmick uh, than we've seen with Murders at Karloff Manor and we've seen with Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Uh, you could tell there's a lot more care and a lot more love put into the Duskborn set for sure. Yeah, I mean, with... Uh... I think the for me actually the theme is in the opposite direction. Even though I'm not a huge horror fan, I like all of the concepts and especially the art. Um, mm-hmm. I think that they're they're also doing some really interesting things in both. You know, like you said, in Bloomborough and in Duskmorn, with uh, with reaching a little further in different directions of mechanics. Um, the one that comes to mind for Bloomborough would be the expend or the forage. With this one, with the survival or the eerie, um, I'm I you know what I'm excited to I'm excited to get my hands on these and to play them and uh, you know really see where they end up on our list at the end of the year. I I've noticed kind of a pattern I think with magic releases at least in the last couple of years where I feel like they start the year off soft. Um, if you look at, uh, it was mm. like Brothers War, All Will Be One, March of the Machines are like kind of soft compared to what we got later in the year with Wilds of Eldraine and Lost Caverns of Ixalan. And then this year we have Murders of Karloff Manor, Outlaws of Thunder Junction, a little bit soft. The summer releases, we had our Lord of the Rings set last year. We had Modern Horizons 3 that kind of revitalized stuff. And then... With Duskmorn and Bloomborough, I feel like being the better two sets of the year. It seems like th- whatever's going on around the holiday season and in, in Wizards for like the design space, I feel like they just kind of like some more things slip through the cracks a bit. Uh, I might just be reading into it a little bit too much too, but hmm. who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. My cat. It's hard to say. This fucking cat <laughs> is un. <laughs> She's under a dresser. Two toys. Two toys. One in each paw. One in each paw. And then there's a third toy that she's staring at that has like a little jingly bell on it. And I'm like... I think she's just happy that I'm home and not at work right now. So, all right. Wrap up time. Wrap up time. We've got three little items to uh, wrap up. Just cover and touch. Make sure we hit on some of the important things. Uh, every single week. Uh, first, uh, Greg Tito 
Greg Tito is leaving Wizards of the Coast. Greg Tito, uh, formerly the communication manager in charge of overseeing messaging for the Dungeons and Dragons brand, is departing Wizards of the Coast for a career in the public sector. He announced he would be join, joining the Washington Secretary of State's office, starting effectively immediately, ending his nine-year stint at Wizards. Uh, he will be the deputy director of external affairs for the Washington Secretary of State's office office good for him that sounds miserable uh i i would certainly right. hope that the pay is much better <laughs> uh but uh he he was given much praise as he was a driving force for establishing the dungeons and dragons community and uh, received official support for wizards during the early years of fifth edition he was one of the co-hosts for dragon talk which was the dungeons and dragons podcast uh and interestingly enough the this article on nworld.org that i'm reading um the <laughs> one of the the guests on an episode of Dragon Talk in 2019 uh Steve Hobbs is going to be his new boss at uh the Secretary of State's office so that's very fun. Uh Dragon Talk of course went on hiatus back last summer go. in July of 2023 and uh has not really been back since. But Greg Tito uh he's hosted a lot of like live events. He's just kind of been uh, one of the um, a public facing person for the brand for a while. And uh, yeah, yeah. He's one of the, he's one of the few over there that people are like, yeah, we like that one. He's a good one. So uh, he will be, he will be greatly missed. And I wonder how long until he drives himself crazy in the public sector and tries to come back into gaming. <laughs> well, you know, if Steve, Hall, you know, if it sounds like he's got some connections in there, so who knows? Hopefully, you know, best of luck to him. Good luck. Good luck. All right. Because one controversy at Wizards of the Coast is not enough. We have a second one this time for D and D. Uh, last episode, it was this group of people over here being all upset that D and D Beyond is going to delete all of their content, which they weren't. And now it's all the people over here that are upset that D and D is no longer D and D because when you cast Heroes Feast, you can create things like sushi and tacos, which are not D and D. So. This one has just caused a lot of confusion. Uh, there is art in the new player's handbook that depicts an adventuring party where a cleric is obviously casting the hero's feast spell and you get things like your classic, like big ham, you've got tea, like a whole bunch of snacks and stuff. And then floating in the air magically is a taco. And then there's also a tray of sushi as well. And for some reason, this pissed a lot of people off. And then it pissed off the people that people got pissed off at the people that were pissed off about the fact that there was tacos and sushi in D and D. Um, can we like start putting our energy and care into something that fucking matters for once? Like that would be nice. I'm over it personally. Anyway, look, you know, it's it's one of those things where where if I do it in my game, hey, if I'm the dungeon master, I can do it. Damn it, I can do it. But if Wizards of the Coast does it, fuck them. Mm -hmm. That's what this feels like. Yeah, no, no. How dare they? How dare they try to include food that people like? I mean, we played we played in a game that our friend Darren ran, and I, my character was obsessed with making breakfast sandwiches with croissants, like. It, it, weird food things in fantasy like it mixes it's fine who gives a shit it's art if you don't want to have sushi at your D&D &D table you don't have to have sushi at your D&D &D table <sighs> like there's so many other things nope. that you could be you, you could be upset about with D&D &D and like anyway uh, last thing last thing because have, have sushi or tacos I don't care um, last thing we're going to talk about, yeah. uh, with the upcoming release in the next week of the player's handbook reviews are coming out. And as expected, we all could have guessed this. The general consensus is the books are a bit better, a little bit different than original five E and you don't need to rush out to buy them. So much like we had been saying for many episodes of this podcast, yes, the system is better. No, it is fine. You do not need to run out and buy it. You can still play your D&D &D how you like to play it as you do now, uh, which I feel like happens 
every single time a new edition of D&D comes out, it's like, why are they getting rid of 3.5? We want 3.5. And then fourth edition comes out and it fails. And then they release fifth edition. They're like, why would you do that? We want 3.5. And they skip over 4E because it's 4E. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Jesus. And here's the thing. Uh, Even even to this day, you you know, people are playing (laughs) 3.5 out there. People will be playing fifth edition. Exactly. For for years to come, and and there will be a bunch of new people introduced mm-hmm. with the 2024 revision of Fifth Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition. That's all they'll ever know, and that's fine. It's totally fine, and I bet there's going to be a lot of people that are going to take 2014 5e and then take aspects of 2024 and graft it onto them. Like if you're playing 2014 5e, why wouldn't you take the Weapon Mastery system? If, if you're if you're playing in a game yeah. where you're wanting to build like fortresses and stuff, why not use the bastion system? Like there, you can mix the match however you want as long as your table is cool with it. So again, people need to calm the fuck down. Yeah, in general, which people do. So anyway. yeah, they do. They yeah, do. that. That is all we have for the news today. Uh, we'll shout out our $15 and up patron, Brandon Vol. Brandon, we love you very much. You help us out quite a bit. You cover this Riverside subscription, which allows us to record the podcast remotely. <laughs> we very much appreciate that, and thank you. Sam, <laughs> this has been a good time. This has been a good time. Um, do you, Yeah. Just, Kat, calm down. My goodness. Do you have any plans for purchasing a Duskborn pre-release kit? Or do you want to, like, come over and we can do, like, a little pre-release thing? Mayhaps. Do a little pre-release thing. I think that'd be fun. That'd be fun. That'd be fun. Yeah. I'll, yeah. So next week, uh, the release of this podcast for public feeds will be the 16th. The 20th is when the pre-release season starts. Uh, we might be getting together and do a thing. Who knows? I might even pop up a phone on a tripod and we'll do old school TikTok live because why not? Who gives a shit? Um, there you go. There yes. you go. I, I hope you I hope you enjoy your time. Um, yeah. Also, beware Phyrexians. They'll fuck you up. I have two copies of Urza's Incubator, so one of them is in here. Ha ha ha. I'm evil. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Uh... With all, the, with all of that being said, we love you very much, and as always, 